All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. I do hope that you are having a good time. This is the fifth in a series of videos that I've made for a critical thinking course. This is the fourth video that is assigned as homework. In this video, we're going to start looking at deductive arguments, but before that, let's review some of the things we've learned that apply to all arguments. So one thing that's important for this video is that we are going to use some words in the normal meaning and some words in a special meaning. So in the normal meaning, we have words like contradiction, which means two things that can't be true at the same time, excluded, which means you have to pick one or the other, disjunction or disjunctive, which means or, conjunction, which means and, hypothetical, which means if this is the case, then something else, so it's basically if then, syllogism, which is a term for an argument that has three terms, this is an idea we get from Aristotle, and the word probable, there are some other words that have a special meaning. So the word deductive has the meaning enekteki. Another concept is strong and weak in the concept of arguments is how likely they are to convince you that their conclusion is true. Valid is the word dato, so not yuko, but rather dato. And it has the special meaning in a deductive argument of if an argument is a valid deductive argument, then if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. I will explain that in much more detail later, so don't worry if that doesn't make sense yet. So invalid is if there's a problem that makes it so a deductive argument does not have this property. Sound is when an argument is valid and has all true premises. So inductive is kind of the opposite of deductive, so inductive has the meaning of being, being kinoteki, a statement, as we will see in the next slide, is something that is either true or false. If you want the Japanese word, it's meidai. And a dilemma is a special type of argument. So, let's review what we saw in the previous lectures. A statement is something that can be either true or false. So statements are usually, but not always, stated declaratively. So I explained to you on the previous one, the sky is blue. This is a statement. It is a true claim. We can look at the world, decide whether this is true. And most of the time, this will be true. How are you? This is a question. It is not a statement. It does not have a truth value. I don't know if it's true or false. Gosh, or many other types of exclamations, ouch, things like that. I don't know what they mean per se, but they are not statements. They do not have a truth value. There's nothing we can test to see whether this is true or not. Finally, things like I don't like you, expressions of feeling, are complicated. They are probably statements, but they are difficult to evaluate. It's hard to know whether they are true or not directly. When we are making arguments or when we are evaluating arguments, we try to make them as logical as possible. We want to identify the conclusion and the premises, and we want to make sure they have a good structure. This means either conclusion, premise, premise, or premise, premise, conclusion. If we do that, we're going to get an argument that is easy for other people to follow. This is a very important thing to do, both when making and when evaluating arguments. We also learn to be concise, concrete, and consistent, and to argue based on reasonable justifications, not using emotion or force. So I talked a lot about that in the previous video. So I want to talk to you about a dream. So that dream is that a deductive argument has a very interesting and special property. And that is that if you have a deductive argument, if all of the premises are true in a valid deductive argument, the conclusion must also be true. So this means if we use the right tools, if we follow the rules to make a valid deductive argument, all we have to do is check the premises. Every other type of argument, we both have to check the premises and we can argue about whether or not we think that these justifications make sense, but the justifications used in a valid deductive argument are ones that we agree already do make sense. Let's move on. So the goal of any argument is to convince your audience of the truth of your conclusion based on your premises and your justifications. So we have premises, justification, goal. We want to convince people that this is true. Now, this means that the premises and justifications work together and either false premises or bad justification can break an argument. In a valid deductive argument, there's a special property. They can guarantee you a true conclusion if you have true premises. The justifications are extremely strong to the point where people do not doubt them. Moreover, we can see if an argument is deductive, validly deductive, without knowing anything about the truth of its premises. 
The trick is that we can look at the justifications and decide if it is a valid deductive argument. So let's just recap that concept of validity. With a valid deductive argument, if we have all true premises, um, then we are guaranteed a true conclusion. If we have one or more false premises, the conclusion could be true or false. With any other type of argument, even with all true premises, it's the case that the conclusion can still be false. And again, if we have one or more false premises, they can still have a false conclusion or a true conclusion. I word it another way. For everything except a valid deductive argument, we don't know, just based on the premises, whether or not the conclusion is true. We may have a very strong reason to believe it would be true, but we cannot guarantee that it is true. So, now we're going to do something very, very old. So, Aristotle has three different laws of logic. Aristotle's three laws of logic will help us to understand how deductive arguments work. So valid deductive arguments depend on these three rules and several operators to make their justification. So an operator is something similar to 3 plus 2, the plus is an operator, 3 minus 2, the minus is an operator. And through these rules and these simple operators, we are going to see how to make an argument that is truth preserving, meaning if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. And if it follows these rules, we're going to call it valid. First off, the law of identity. The law of identity is that A is the same as itself. We could write this if we want to write it using kind of algebra, A is A, A equals A. So this is important. This law is something that sets us up to do everything else. If this is not true, everything falls apart. So this seems very obvious, but this is a very important concept in math and in philosophy. This is the concept that things have a type of permanence. They stay the same. If things don't stay the same, I can't prove anything. If they're not staying the same, be my guest, do whatever you want. So here are some examples of keeping this law of identity. A dog is a dog, Dr. K is Dr. K, a sunny day is a sunny day. Breaking the law of identity, earlier in an argument, I refer to something, say it's a dog, later in the argument, I say it's a cat. I, for some reason, say that Crayon Shinchan is Anpanman. These things are not the case. This is breaking the law of identity. This is two things being the same thing, or the same thing being two things. Either way, it's going to break everything. All right, the law of identity is kind of too obvious. It's kind of hard to think about it, but it relates to idea for arguing of being clear. It also relates to consistency specifically. The benefit is it makes our arguments easier to follow and avoids tricky situations. The challenge is that language doesn't always work this way. So one problem is sometimes the same word has different meanings in different contexts. So we're going to try and avoid doing that because if we use that, that is going to create problems. The second law that we can talk about is the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction is that A and not A cannot both be true when A has the same meaning in both cases. So we write this algebraically as not, left parentheses, a and, not a, right parentheses. So this is very important. You need to make sure your parentheses are there. If you just say not a and not a, you said the same thing twice. If you say not, parentheses, a and not a, then you're saying something. What you're saying is that the same claim and its opposite cannot both be true at the same time. Examples. You cannot both be a man and not a man at the same time. You cannot both be passing and failing this class at the same time. If you said that Fido is a dog and Fido is not a dog, you are breaking this. If you said that Crayon Shinchan is Anpanman and not Anpanman, you are breaking this. You are making something true and false at the same time. The benefit of this law is that this makes it so our arguments are reasonable. This enables us to work towards conclusions. It also makes it so that we can avoid some very complex puzzles, and sometimes it feels like it's cheating. There's one very interesting thing about this law, and that this law is tied to a belief about contradiction. So contradiction is when two opposite things are true at the same time. What this law does that's interesting with contradiction is that this law makes it so if we accept that there cannot be contradictions, we can move forward. So this can be a problem if you actually believe contradictions can happen at the same time. Finally, the law of the excluded middle. The law of the excluded middle is that if we have a claim, let's say A, either A is true or A is false when A has the same meaning in both cases. 
So Fido is a dog or Fido is not a dog. It is raining or it is not raining. We can't have some middle ground, drizzling, other things. We don't have ways to say that in this system. We don't have partial truth. We can break this. They may have scored a goal. You have to decide on this logical system. Did they score a goal or did they not score a goal? Crayon Shinchan is maybe Ampaman. You have to decide, is Crayon Shinchan Ampaman or is he not Ampaman? We have to make these things definite. There is no room for a middle in this system. So let's look at some cases for the law of the excluded middle. The computer is half on. Can't do that. The dog is half alive. What does that mean? Is the dog alive or not alive? It is half night now. Is it night? Is it not night? We do not have room for these ideas in the system. Uh, what's hard is that there are some things where we actually feel that we speak this way. So he's half asleep. We mean that he's very tired, he's moving slowly. But we have to pick. Is he awake or is he asleep? Here, what we actually mean is he is awake. The window is half open. In this case, I would say on this logical system, the window, in fact, is open because that's what it means. Uh, also, I kind of like katoya ramen. You have to pick. Do you like katoya or do you not like katoya? The benefit is that everything has to be true or false. The challenge is the real world has lots of things that don't seem that true or false. So, for instance, if we had a pool that is full of water, would we say the pool is deep or not? So, if the pool is 10 meters deep, we all agree that's a deep pool. If the pool is 2.5 meters deep, is that deep or not? We have to decide in order to use things like that in a deductive system. So let's look at operators. Operators are words that have special meaning in deductive arguments, and these are the ways that the arguments move forward. So the first one, not. True when its opposite is false. Snow is not warm, and true when both parts are true. Hokkaido is cold in winter, and snow is not warm, or True in our definition when either part is true. Either we are in Asekao or we are not. If then, true if the left part implies the right part. If one object strikes another, the second will move. If it is sunny, then it is daytime. So I'm going to talk about all of these in a lot more detail. Um, so you don't need to have mastered exactly how these work yet. I'll explain them using some charts. So I want to explain some English about conditionals because I will use this in some other videos and in many contexts. I'll probably ask you questions about this. If America wins against Germany, then they will enter the tournament stage of the World Cup. We call the part, if America wins against Germany, the antecedent, and the part, then they will enter the tournament stage of the World Cup, the consequent. So antecedent literally means comes before, consequent literally means follows from. So we just happen to use Latin-based words. So the part that it comes before is the condition, is another word for it. It's the thing that we need to fulfill in order to get to the consequent. Let's look at some standard argument patterns. These are extremely important. These are patterns that we use every day, at least in the Western world. And these are patterns that we use, and I will later prove to you they are all valid. This is the first pattern I want to teach you, modus ponens. If people are thirsty, then people should drink water. People are thirsty, therefore people should drink water. So we have an if-then sentence, and then we have the condition fulfilled, and therefore we have the results coming out. If you want to stay in Japan, then you should learn Japanese. You want to stay in Japan, you should learn Japanese. The pattern is if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. Modus tollens. So modus tollens has the same word modus at the beginning, but it's the opposite in direction. If I am using an umbrella, then it is raining. It is not raining, therefore I am not using an umbrella. If you are learning French, you are taking a French class or reading a French book. You are not taking a French class or reading a French book. Therefore, you are not learning French. Pattern is if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Now, it's very important here. Remember, this is not Q, resulting in not P. So we'll see later that there are other forms that don't match this, but this is the form that we want to work from. If we symbolize it, we're going to get this symbolization on the right, or there could be a variety of other symbolizations. I'm not making you symbolize for this class, but if you happen to know one, you're welcome to use it. Hypothetical syllogism. So hypothetical syllogism is something that has this pattern. If I'm using an umbrella, it is raining. If it is raining, then the flights are delayed. Therefore, if I'm using an umbrella, flights are delayed. Another one. 
If you eat tuna, you are a part of overfishing. If you are a part of overfishing, you should feel guilt. Therefore, if you eat tuna, you should feel guilt. So this pattern is quite simple. If P, then Q. If Q, then R. Therefore, if P, then R. Here's the symbolization over on the right. So this is a disjunctive syllogism. So the center of this pattern is or. This uses it one or and one not. This is very important for understanding this pattern. So either I am married or I am single. I am not single, therefore I am married. You can go to Honshu by train or by airplane. You did not go by airplane, therefore you went by train. P or Q, not P, therefore Q. Symbolized over here on the right. So, dilemma. Dr. K either made the flight or he did not. If he made the flight, he will eat steak on the plane. If he missed the flight, he will eat at hamazushi. Therefore, Dr. K will either eat steak or hamazushi. So we have an or, we have two if-thens, and we look at either of the consequences. P or Q, if P then R, if Q then S, therefore R or S. So here we have it symbolized. There's a second form of dilemma. They're actually not that different, but let's just look at this one. Stephanie is either in Sapporo or Asaikawa. If she is in Sapporo, she wants to eat udon. If she's in Asaikawa, she wants to eat udon. Therefore, Stephanie wants to eat udon. So this one is similar, but we just have S or A. If S, then U. If A, then U. Therefore, U. So in this case, we have the same or, two if-thens. It's just they have the same outcome. So, this one symbolized over here on the right. So today we learned the five basic forms of deductive arguments and their symbolization. So that would be modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, and dilemma. So I do hope that you are enjoying these videos. I hope that they're easy to understand. Please remember to ask me questions in class if you're having trouble understanding them. Uh, this week we learned the basic concept of validity and we learned three laws of logic and we learned five basic argument forms. Next week we're going to look at validity in more detail and learn how to check if something is valid and how to correctly understand the operators that we are using. Thank you for your time and attention. I really think if you're not getting it, please start asking questions in class. The key to passing this class is understanding the material. So I will see you next time.